The Holy Land, a 2016 Biblical Journey. We can worship according to Yahweh's word, or we can worship according to man's tradition. Emperor Constantine, a sun worshiper, solidified the change from Sabbath to Sunday. In the first 300 years of the New Testament, the church made hundreds of changes in doctrine. It's time that we follow scripture and not the traditions of man. Welcome to Shattering Traditions. It's a blessing to have you with us. We are right now in the land of Israel at a site known as Tel Dan. This is in the north, northern border of Israel near the borders of Lebanon and Syria. Originally, this city was uh, Laish uh, that we find that in Judges and also Isaiah. A uh, relator named Dan, when the tribe of Dan conquered this site, you know, we find uh, cultic activities, uh, many, many periods of Persians, a Hellenistic and also the Roman. Now, as I mentioned, we're in the uh, northeast uh, corner of Israel. And uh, here we find uh, the largest of the uh, four sources for the Jordan River, and that's the, uh, the uh, river, uh, the, the Dan Spring. Now, we find some amazing uh, archaeological sites here. Number one, we find a, a, a they call it Abraham's Gate, and uh, somewhere around the 1750 BCE. And we also find remains of the old city of Dan. Let me share with you some of those. And, by the way, we have uh, Elder Alan with us uh, here in Israel. And Alan, why don't you sort of share with the uh, group here what we see? Well, this is the altar. Um, Jeroboam set up false worship and uh, at Dan and also Bethel. Mm -hmm. This is where they, they really, uh, I think it was the prophet uh, would s said that prophesied that uh, that altar would fall apart. Anyway, uh, this is also where he had uh, put up a golden calf. And according to some archaeologists, by the way, that actually stood right here. Now, I don't know if they know that for sure, mm -hmm. but uh, it's believed that the, uh, the golden calf might have been right in that very place, which is really you know, amazing when you think about what we find here, the altar and yep. golden calf. I, I think what uh, most archaeologists believe is this is a high place. Mm -hmm. This is where they would worship. So they would sacrifice down there. They would have the golden... Uh, uh, calf uh, here, and then they would worship here in the high places. Uh, the the pagans often uh, would. Of course, this was under Jeroboam. And uh, again, you know, it's amazing because the terrain here. We are literally right uh, between, if you will, or the corner of Lebanon and uh, Syria. But for me, uh, this site and Tel Dan, by the way, is a very, very big uh, na uh, national park here. But uh, this, by far, is the most I think notable area mm -hmm. in the old city of uh, Tel Dan, and and, and what it historically and scripturally represents. I want to go over here and let's talk a little bit about what this site represents because it really is just a phenomenal site. I mean, I, I, you know, I think out of all the sites in Israel, I tell people this is probably a second or third. I don't know which one. It competes with Megiddo. But it's really just a phenomenal site with the history and the archaeology to think that, I mean, here just down from us is the place of the altar where uh, Jeroboam sacrificed and uh, really perverted uh, Yahweh's worship. But why don't you read, read to us, and, and maybe you can uh, uh, explain exactly uh, some of the things he did here. It came to me now as Josiah, the one that, that prophesied that altar would fall. Yeah, After yeah. he'd have a golden yeah, calf worship and all of that. First Kings chapter 12, verse 25. And by the way, uh, to that point, there's no altar there. I mean, you, you have the foundation stones. Well, he got it right, so, didn't he? Yeah, absolutely. 
First Kings cap chapter 12, verse 25, we read, Then Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim, and dwelt therein, and went out from thence, and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of Yahweh at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their master, even unto, unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me, and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold, your Elohim, O Israel, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. And this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. And he made an house of high places and made priests of the low, lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month on the fifteenth day of that month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel, the fifteenth day of the eighth month even in the mount, month which he had devised of his own heart and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel, and he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. So that, that story happened, or at least part, partially happened right here. Yes. Uh, just a, I don't know, a few feet from us. I mean, literally, you can see the altar here, and again, you can see the uh, platform where the golden calf stood, and, and here in the high place, of course, Yahweh says, don't do anything on the high place, and that's exactly what they did, but here in the high place, they would worship and, and, and do all kinds of pagan things, I'm sure. So this this is uh, where it all happened. So, so what are the things, some of the points? Matter of fact, before we talk about that, for, for those who may not be familiar with Jeroboam, let's quickly talk about what led up to uh, this, uh, this division. Uh, prior to uh, Jeroboam, uh, you had uh, Solomon, I guess, technically Rehoboam. Uh, Solomon dies, uh, the nation of Israel splits, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Between north and south. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rehoboam, Solomon's son, took the north, and or the south, I south. should say. And, yes. and uh, Rehoboam then took the, uh, the northern kingdom, which was 10 of the tribes. Jeroboam, and, yeah. uh, Jeroboam, thank you for keeping me straight there. And so you have Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Uh, Jeroboam in the south, uh, uh, Rehoboam in the south, and uh, Jeroboam in the north. And uh, anyway, to prevent the nation of Israel from reuniting, uh, what he did is he changed worship. He knew, or at least he believed at the time, that if Israel would go back to uh, Jerusalem, which was in the south, to worship Yahweh as, as commanded, that uh, basically they would uh, uh, kill him for treason. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he wanted uh, to prevent that. And that's what led up to this story, that he set up a golden calf uh, here in Dan and also a golden calf in uh, Bethel. And uh, just to sort of give a ge ge geographical uh, marker, uh, again, we're, we're in the north. So Dan represents the north and Bethel would represent the south. So wherever you were in the country, you could go to the south or north and you could worship Yahweh, if you will, through this golden calf. And, right. But uh, anyway, so, so those are sort of the history and what led up to this point. What are some of the lessons we find here? Well, we can see where Jeroboam actually counterfeited true worship with false worship. And mm -hmm. to keep, like you say, keep people here and not going down to Jerusalem, he established a counterfeit almost like theirs, except for some basic, very, uh, very difficult, uh, uh, in our minds, uh, worship that, that uh, you know, you, you could never accept. For one thing, he changed the date from what mm -hmm. Yahweh ordained. Uh, feast day from the seventh to the eighth month of the fifteenth of the eighth month, he replaced Yahweh with a golden calf, mm -hmm. which was an abomination. Yeah, absolutely. And then he ordained the lowest of the people. The Levites were supposed to be the priests. Well, he just grabbed anybody, you know, lowest of the people, and made them. In fact, I think he made himself a priest, if I remember. Mm -hmm. So uh, he, he he perverted worship. You know what's amazing? I think about Jeroboam is when Solomon did what he did, and that is, you know, we can read in 1 Kings 11, I think it is, where, where Solomon committed all these horrible sins for his wife. So even worship indication is maybe even Demolik and some of these other uh, deities, just, just horrible things. And you would think of all people, David's son would have done better than what he did. And, mm -hmm. But uh, that, that being said, uh, he really uh, initiated the, the split again through his sin. It wasn't really Jeroboam. You know, many people think it was Jeroboam. It wasn't, it was Solomon. It was Solomon's sin that led to this point. Right. Now, uh, Jeroboam, you know, was uh, Yahweh uh, came to him uh, 
and uh, basically said, if, if uh, you will obey me and, and do my will and, and follow me, you're going to be blessed. Mm -hmm. And what's the first thing Jeroboam does? Yeah. <laughs> he completely uh, changes and apostatizes, uh, as you say, uh, the, the worship there. Yeah. Well, you know, they would, they would take it from Solomon, even though he was going haywire there toward the end. Yeah. But they weren't going to take it from his son. No. So uh, Jeroboam jumps in there, an opportunist, and say, hey, look, follow me then. Mm -hmm. If you're unsatisfied, follow me, and I'll set up a... I'll set up worship up here mm -hmm. and also at Bethel too. You know, Yahweh had it all worked out though for Jeroboam, and that's that's the one thing I really find amazing about Jeroboam because if he would only, if he would have only stayed uh, on the straight and narrow yes. and, and, and followed and obeyed his Father in heaven as, as Yahweh told him to do, he would have been blessed mm -hmm. and uh, he would not have had to uh, compromise worship. But you know that you've already sort of mentioned all three of these points, but. All three are so important because it, you know, Jeroboam was condemned for this. And by the way, you know what's also fascinating is, is the nation of Israel was, was never the same. You know, with, with Judah, uh, once after the split, you know, you'd have a good king and then maybe a few bad kings and a good king and a few bad kings and a good king and a few bad kings and so on and so forth. In Israel, there was no good kings, right. not one. And, and yeah, I blame Jeroboam in part because he set the tone sure. for the nation and everybody sort of followed his example from that point on. Yeah, he established the false worship from the beginning with a wrong foundation. Everything went kittywampus from that point on. I mean, it never, never was right from that yeah. point. It, it, and I think Jeroboam, really, if anything, he's an example of why it's important to get things right. Mm -hmm. You know, Yahweh's worship is so precise. And he says, you know, worship me in the way I want you to worship. And if, and if you don't, there's consequences. That's right. And I think it's so, so the three big sins we see here is number one is as you mentioned He changed the date. So again, yeah, I was very specific He says, you know, if you, if you if I say you worship me on this month on this day, you do that You don't change it. You don't manipulate it. You don't compromise that date uh, Same thing with the golden calf, which was probably the the worst offense I think and you know, what's interesting though when I read the Bible and you tell me what you think but when I read the Bible and, and I read what he says about the golden calf, it was not a, a different mighty one. It was a replacement or an extension of Yahweh. Well, they would look at this image and say, this is Yahweh. Exactly. They weren't saying exactly. this is Baal. They were saying this is Yahweh, worship, worship. And that's what they wanted. They wanted a, something tangible to look at, mm -hmm. to bow down to, because uh, they didn't have it. You know, Moses went up to the mount and uh, where was Yahweh? So they made, you know, had Aaron produce a calf so they can mm -hmm. bow down to it. There's Yahweh right there. Yeah, you know? yeah it's amazing. You, you see this prayer too. Yeah. Uh, they, they had an issue with idol worship and, and evidently golden calves with that. Mm -hmm. uh, two more things I want to talk about and then we'll probably take a short break. But uh, before that, I want to talk about these two things. So we've talked about the, the date, you know, the golden calf. So those are the two. The last one is, and I think this is important and, and, and we see lessons in this even today. He ordained pr uh, priests of the lowest of the people. You know, we find Paul in the Old Testament or in New Testament saying that, that a, a bishop, which is an elder, really nothing, that nothing more than an elder, uh, needs to be above reproach or, or blameless. Mm -hmm. And uh, same concept well, of the, new, the, the Old Testament. The principle carries down all the way through. Yeah, I mean, no, no difference. And there's a reason for that. You know, that's, it, Yahweh knew that if, if you have a bad leader, you're going to have a bad, mm -hmm. the people are going to be following in that suit. So you've got to make sure that that's right from the start, and then you you can you know go from there. Yeah. Uh, but this guy, he wasn't even in the house of David. He was uh, Jeroboam was a general in the in the in the uh, armed services, you might yeah. say. So he wasn't even part of the family. So you know it wasn't a lineage down from you know David, Solomon, and Rehoboam, and so forth. So that's another problem with, yeah. with yeah. his uh, setup. So uh, let's take a quick break and uh, we'll, we'll come back. We'll talk about Jeremiah and uh, some of the other passages talking about false worship. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask you to stay tuned. Don't go anywhere because we're going to come back. We're going to talk more about Tel Dan and the implications of Tel Dan. We're going to look at Jeremiah and many, many other passages. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Coming up. Winter solstice, things coming back yeah. alive again. It's all, it all mixed in, up yeah. together. Apart from the uh, from the biblical feast days, mm -hmm. where they didn't want to do anything Jewish. Tell Dan. 
Hebrew for Mound of Dan, is located in the northeast corner of the land of Israel, near the borders of Lebanon and Syria. It is estimated to have been built around 1750 BCE. Prior to Dan conquering this region, it was called Lashem, as found in Joshua 1947. Genesis 14 tells us that Abraham traveled here to rescue his nephew Lot. After being forced out of central Israel by the Philistines, they conquered and renamed the location Dan. It was here where Jeroboam erected a golden calf to prevent the ten northern tribes from returning to Jerusalem. We find in 1 Kings 12.26, And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David, if this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of Yahweh at Jerusalem. Then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their sovereign, even unto Rehoboam king of Judah, and they shall kill me, and go again to Rehoboam king of Judah. Whereupon the king took counsel, and made two calves of gold, and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy mighty ones, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel, and the other put he in Dan. Shown here is a recreation of where the horned altar would have stood. This is the location the people made sacrifices to the golden calf. As we traverse the steps from the altar, we see on this high place where the golden calf would have stood. It is an eerie feeling as one stands in the exact location Jeroboam profaned Yahweh in proper worship. It was also here at Dan where in 1993 the House of David inscription from the 9th century was found with the words, King of the House of David. This is the oldest artifact today confirming King David of the Bible as a historic figure. This inscription is now housed in the Israeli Museum in Jerusalem. What does the future hold for you and your loved ones? Bible prophecy has the answers. In the book of Daniel, we see a prophetic vision of a statue symbolizing nations from Daniel's time to the present day. With the volatile Middle East powder keg and the current state of unrest we see on a global scale, Bible prophecy is methodically being fulfilled. These 10 nations are playing a huge role right now and most are unaware. Who are they? What role will they play with the anti-Messiah? Are they the European Union as many believe? Are believers completely looking in the wrong place? To understand the identity of these nations is to unlock important end time events that will usher in the second coming of the Messiah. Request our free booklet, The Prophecy of the Beast and the Ten Toes. No gimmicks, simply a free gift to guide you through the times ahead. Call now, 1-573-896-1000. Can't wait? Then read it online right now, yrm.org. I'd like to welcome you back to Shattering Traditions. It's a blessing to have you with us. Or as you can see, we're not in a, the land of Israel anymore. We're in our set or a studio here at Yahweh's Restoration Ministry here in the States. Uh, we were talking about King Jeroboam and uh, the sin that he was guilty of. And I think we left off talking about Jeremiah chapter 10. So I want to uh, start there now, and maybe um, you can do that for us. Start with Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 2. It's such an important passage as it relates to, uh, I think, what Jeroboam did and what we really e even see within nominal worship today. So, Alan, if you would read yeah, that. Yeah, it kind of sums up the whole problem with Jeroboam. In 10.2, uh, it says, Thus says Yahweh, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cuts a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen, with the axe, they deck it with silver and with gold, and they fasten it with nails and with hammers, that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, they speak not. They must needs be born, because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it th in them to do good. Yeah, so, so what's your thoughts with that, I, and well, how it relates to uh, Jeroboam and what he did? Yeah, well, Jeroboam was into making up his own worship. And basically, this goes back to uh, 
uh, old nature worship, tree worship. Mm -hmm. um, they would have the groves where they would go in and and uh, sacrifice and whatever worship in these groves, these carved up trees, well, manufactured which really, trees. You know, if you look at that, the groves, and I don't know how many people really uh, look into these things, but it really goes back to phallic worship. It's just mm -hmm. a horrible, abominable form of worship. Yeah, they would and, shape uh, these trees in that image and yeah. uh, and worship there. Yeah, I mean, that's about as gross as it can get. And what's this talking about? Some people say, well, this is talking about Christmas. Well, in a way, there's a, there's a connection there mm -hmm. because, you know, look so, at the so trees. So what's the connection? I... Yeah. So, so look at the trees. I mean, uh, people set up their trees and nail them down and put gift offerings before them, you know, and uh, underneath and sit around and adore them. I mean, that's... If it's not tree worship, it's as close as you can get to yeah. it. And Well, the thing is, too, you know, if you understand Christmas, I don't want to get into, uh, uh, we're going to do that later, but the Christmas tree actually goes back to the Yule log and this concept that the the uh, evergreen trees uh, did not lose their leaves and uh, representing life. And uh, again, this is pagan concept. It's, it's not something we see in scripture. Yeah, I mean, why evergreen? Uh, basically, go back to Babylon, mm -hmm. Semiramis, and Nimrod, and... Uh, Tammuz came to life again as a tree, as a, uh, their son Tammuz as a tree, of a, something green and then fits in, of course, with the, uh, with the ever-living tree. Winter solstice, things coming back yeah. alive again. It's all, it all fits mixed in. up yeah, together. Absolutely. And uh, this is how they tried to justify their worship. Yeah. Well, you know, for me, probably the biggest thing, what we see in uh, Jeremiah 10 verse 2 is, is where he says, learn not the way of the heathen. Mm -hmm. You know, it's amazing. You look at Christianity, you, you look at nominal worship, and you compare what we see there with the Bible, and there, there's absolutely nothing uh, really <laughs> in, in parallel with, with what we see between the two. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so many of the uh, holidays we uh, see today are adopted from paganism, whether that be from uh, Christmas or Easter. And again, we'll, we'll, we may talk a little bit more about that later on in the, the program near the end. But the, the connection, in my mind, between uh, what Jeroboam did and what we see even with the nominal worship today is the fact that it's heathen worship. It's mm -hmm. man-made worship. And, you know, one thing Yahweh, we, we find from Yahweh's word is that when he says to do something, we're to do it. And, uh, you know, he doesn't accept counterfeit worship. And it, it's just amazing, you know, how many people, Bible-believing people out there, believe, you know, that this is that this is okay, that this is kosher according to Yahweh's word. Well, this and, is the main thrust of our ministry is to go back to the truth of the scriptures, mm -hmm. to go back to what the scriptures say and not what man has added through tradition and through uh, his, uh, you know, worship through the, mm -hmm. through the years. Yeah. Uh, what we're trying to do is carve all that out and get rid of it and bring it back to the true worship of, you know, what he gave to Israel. That's yeah. the foundation. We got Jeroboam coming along and he, he wants to establish his own religion. Mm -hmm for his own purposes. So he establishes uh, two different places to worship, uh, Bethel yeah, yeah. And, uh, and Dan, and uh, establishes his own, basically makes his own temple up there, makes his own deities, the two, the two calves, the golden calves set up at each yeah. city, just to keep people from going to the truth in Jerusalem where, well, where you know, uh, Rehoboam you, was. You say that, I just had a thought in my mind why did the, the church, if you will, the, the Roman church, and, and eventually yet, you know, many Protestant and other denominations follow suit, depart from the, uh, from the biblical feast days? Mm -hmm. Or they didn't want to do anything Jewish. You know, they wanted to get away from this concept of Jewish worship, so they abandoned the Passover, they abandoned you know, unleavened bread, they abandoned all these uh, biblical feast days, and, and in, in lieu of these pagan holidays that they would adopt, you know, through, throughout a time, you know, for, in, for instance, we know that they adopted uh, Christmas from Saturnalia and, and Mithraism, and, and of course, the uh, Easter uh, holiday would, would come from the Anglo-Saxons uh, much, much later, but, but uh, it really, it's really the same thing. You know, Jeroboam did not want the people going back down uh, to worship there in the uh, southern kingdom, the, the, the kingdom of Judah. Same thing with the church. They don't want people going back to, uh, if you will, Judaism or, or the Jewish faith or really biblical faith. I mean, you know, people see these as Jewish days of worship, but the reality is Yahweh says, these are my days. Isn't it amazing? Man will do anything but the right thing when it comes yeah. to worship. Yeah. He'll pick up traditions and, and worship from thousands of years ago and add it 
Mm-hmm. Like when the Xmas uh, you know, celebration comes along, or Ishtar, Easter, same deal. And again, you got you know examples like Jeroboam, and Yahweh just condemned Jeroboam. You know, th- there was nothing rewarding about what Jeroboam did. He was condemned, and, and as we noted, I think in the first segment, uh, every other king within the history of Israel was was bad. It, mm-hmm. it was a bad king after the pattern of uh, Jeroboam. You Matter of fact, off on the wrong foot. I mean, y- right some the of the start. kings you actually see like Jeroboam were the sin of Jeroboam. Uh, mm-hmm. The sin of Jeroboam became almost an example of, of just rebellion uh, mm-hmm. to, to Yahweh for what he did. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, we, we see other examples of this, you know, for instance, and in, uh, oh, we see this in Leviticus 18, verses uh, 1 through uh, 3. It says, Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, I am Yahweh Elohim, after the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein you dwelt, shall you not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whether I bring you, you shall not do, neither shall you walk in their ordinances. So, you know, just like Jeremiah, you know, really no different. <laughs> yeah, I was saying, you know, look in Jeremiah 10, don't learn the ways of the heathen. Yes. And in here, in, uh, in Leviticus 18, he's telling Israel, don't mimic, don't follow the, the ways of Egypt and, and the ways of Canaan. And, and, you know, as we know, I mean, the Canaanite worship was just horrible. You know, you, you have, uh, well, I mean, you know, you, you mentioned the um, Asherah and of course, you got a Moloch and, and, and so sure. many other horrible deities that that they wouldn't, that they eventually Israel did mimic and, and follow and and they paid the consequence for that. Well, he knew exactly what man was going to do when he sent them into Canaan. He knew that they were going to look around and look at the worship going on there, all the different varieties of pagan mm-hmm. worship, and start picking it up. It's easier, I guess, to follow man's worship in some ways because it man makes things easier. I mean, uh, well, look so, at, look at uh, the switch from Sabbath to Sunday. It's a lot easier to go to church for 45 minutes mm-hmm. or whatever. You don't have to keep the day as holy. You go out and do whatever you want. After you get done with that obligation, you can go clean the garage. You can go to work. You can go to movies, ball games, whatever you want to do. Yeah. I mean, man always gravitates to the easy yeah. to make things simpler. He doesn't, I, want, he doesn't want to have to change his life, and that's the yeah. secret. And it's just amazing, too, because you know we get a lot of correspondence here at this ministry, and most of us good correspondence, positive correspondence, but every so often we'll get, obviously, some negative correspondence. And so often do we hear something like, where it doesn't matter when we worship, how we worship. You know, He right. knows our hearts. He knows who we're calling on it. It doesn't matter if it's something he or He's ordained. We've baptized this day into something else. It doesn't mean what it did before. All these excuses that we hear within, within the church and within those coming out of the church but the reality is it does matter. You know, Yahweh is so precise. He has so much concern for his worship. And, you know, I think that's, that's a major lesson, a major message uh, we have in this more mes- ministry. And that is to, to realize that Yahweh has a, a worship that he's established and we're to follow suit. You know, we're, we're not to, uh, you know, delve into and, and mimic uh, man-made worship. And the reason really, it all boils down to the fact that those who will not follow Scripture are either ignorant, but it all started with the fact that man does not really know Yahweh. Yeah. They don't really know what he wants. They don't really understand. They don't fear him. And if they did, they'd be so afraid to do anything outside of what he has directed. Yeah. But they don't fear him and they don't care. That's and they think they can make him in his own image, which, of course, goes back to the, you know, the golden calves. You can make it any way you want. That's not what Yahweh says. He was very specific because he knew this was man's proclivity. He was going not to follow him as prescribed, but they were going to keep going off center and getting off into tangents and bringing up their own worship and their own yeah. desires and... It never works. It's fallen. It's failed all the way through history. And yet we keep seeing it. We keep seeing uh, anything but worship of Scripture as it's intended to be. I'm going to share one more passage from Leviticus. Uh, This is verse uh, chapter 20, 23. It says, You shall not walk in the manners of the nations which I cast out before you, for they have committed all these things, therefore I abhorred them. And the word abhorred is, is a very uh, strong word. Uh, mm-hmm. Actually, if you look the word up abomination, maybe the same Hebrew word here, abomination basically means the same thing. as something that Yahweh finds more morally repulsive or disgusting. 
And that's how he views his worship. So those, the, these people, and look, I mean, we realize there's many, many devoted people in the church that are just simply deceived. They, they don't know. Um, maybe Yahweh hasn't shown them the truth yet. Because we do know that, that Yahweh, it, it does require Yahweh opening the eyes of somebody True. to this truth. But, but there's, a, there's a lot of people that out there making excuses mm -hmm. for what they do see. You know, it's not hard to see. And by the way, you know, if, uh, when we start talking about Halloween or Christmas or Easter or some of these other pagan holidays, it's so easy to prove. It is just remarkably how easy it is to prove these things, to, to, to show the error behind these days. You mm -hmm. know, the, the Encyclopedia Britannica, the... The the um, I mean any any really mainstream uh, scholarly reference will show you the the uh, history of these of these days. Let me ask you this: if if somebody came to you and and uh, was asking, you know, what what was wrong with worshiping? I know we've uh, we've talked about it, but in a very concise uh, way, what's wrong with worshiping days like Christmas and Easter? What what would your response be? Well, first of all, uh, you've got to come out. Yahweh says, come out, my people, mm -hmm. and be separate, and touch not the unclean thing. Well, these days are all wrapped up in ancient pagan worship. Sun worship was central to everything. The pagans honored the sun, S-U-N. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, first of all, you got to separate yourself from that and walk in the way he has commanded. And I always say, I say well, what is truth? How do you know? Just follow whatever Yahshua did. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that, that modern worship, and well, has worship throughout the years, not done. They don't follow and do what Yahshua did mm -hmm. and said. They say, well, yeah, he, he sacrificed himself. Yeah, that's right, for our sins, that's right. But he also had a message. He talked about the kingdom. Half of his message was about the kingdom or centered on the kingdom, which means we have to prepare for something mm -hmm. after this life. Then he said, then he said, then we're to commanded to follow him and do what he did. And you know, like I, Paul I, says, follow me as I yeah. follow Messiah. What did he do? Yeah. He kept the Sabbath. He kept the feast days. He honored his father in so many ways. He showed us socially how to interact. Yeah. You know, the widows and the orphans take care of them. All these other things. Which... I mean, here's reality. And I think what you're saying is great because it's so true. A, you know, following Yahshua's examples is precisely what we should be doing as believers. You know, Scripture says he's our example. You know, mm -hmm. you know we're to walk as he walks. So, so as you said, you know, what, what did they do in the, the New Testament? And, and uh, that's not hard to find. Uh, matter of fact, uh, you know, the, the word Sabbath, and this really surprises people, and I've actually gone through Strong's and I've counted them as, as you have, I know. There's a, the word Sabbath occurs 60 times in the New Testament. And even Paul, you know, we find many, many references of Paul keeping and observing the seventh day Sabbath. You know, it's interesting. He never observes Sunday. Never, never, you know, the first day of the week is mentioned a few times. And, and they'll try to make the case, many people, that this is referring to a day of worship. Of course, you know, they're taking it out of, out of context. Well, yeah, it's only found eight times, and yet it never even says Sunday. No. It never even says Christmas. It never even says Easter. Well, and that's the thing, All of you know, these things have been... <laughs> You, twisted. To, you, you have Easter mentioned in 12 verse 4 of Acts, I believe it is. And, in the King and, uh, James. In yeah. the King James. And the Greek is Pasha, though. It's not Easter. And matter of fact, right before there, it talks about the days of unleavened bread. So how does that work? You know, how, does, mm -hmm. how do you have Easter in verse 4 and then days of unleavened bread in verse 3? It doesn't make any sense. And if you're going to keep Easter, why aren't you keeping the you know, days of unleavened bread yeah. along with it? Because that's yeah. part of the, 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 the scope of that passage. But, uh, and, and the problem is, you know, just like Jeroboam did, like with Christmas, for instance, you know, they'll the look at the three wise men. Number one, Scripture doesn't say three wise men. It just says wise men. Mm -hmm. Or they'll, they'll, they'll show the wise men right there in the manger with the, with the uh, shepherds. Or if you look at the chronology of Scripture, it's pretty clear that the wise men were not there in the manger. The wise men were there in a house. And mm -hmm. Yahshua, based on what we see in Matthew, was probably about two years old. Scripture is pretty... And again, most scholars will recognize this. They will say, okay, I, we realize that what we teach and what we say today does not reflect what we find in the Bible. Yeah, the, the shepherds, we know the shepherds were there in the manger or with, with the young or infant Messiah, but, but not the wise men. So there's so many traditions. I mean, even December 25th, you know, when we look at the de December 25th, you know, most scholars will show and point out that the shepherds were not out during that time. And, uh, but, you know, we can also look at the chronology of uh, Zechariah, uh, John the Baptist's father, and uh, anyway, it's kind of a long uh, study there, but, but we know based on that chronology that Yahshua was probably born 
in September. Conceived mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sometime in December, but, but, but born in, in September, probably uh, near or possibly even during the uh, Feast of Tabernacles. And you can tie that in with, without getting in a big study, with yeah. John the Baptist. <laughs> he was six months Exactly, younger. exactly. And so, uh, yeah, you can tie it right into where does it... Well, the 25th of December, obviously, is related to the winter solstice, which uh, the pagans, again, yeah. wanting the sun to come back. Yeah. So about that time, the sun, you know, the days get longer. Look, the sun's coming back. Well, not only that, the the uh, we, we go now going back to Rome. Yeah, Saturnalia, the the, the mm -hmm. festival in, uh, in honor to Saturn, and I think there was a seven day festival that they extended that eventually, and I think it ended was at the twenty third, mm -hmm. I believe, of December. But then you had another cultic worship. This was a mystery a religion. Um, scholars define it as a mystery religion because it was somewhat secretive, but anyway, called Mithraism. It was Mithra as a uh, warrior uh, god, if you will, and. And uh, Mithra was supposedly born on December 25th. Matter of fact, you know, if you look at the similarities with Mithra and uh, the uh, traditional, if, I, if you will, Messiah, because we, you know, the traditional uh, Messiah that we see in the church doesn't fit. It, right. it doesn't square with Scripture. But, right. um, you know, they, they have a lot in common. And why do you suppose that is? <laughs> because they adopted Mithraism into the S-O-N. So they took the worship of the S-U-N and retrofitted that back into the S-O-N in reference to the Messiah. But again, there, there's just absolutely no evidence. And, you know, and, and, and Jeroboam, going back to Jeroboam, he is such a great example of how Yahweh feels about this worship. Yahweh abhors this worship. And again, he told the Israelites way before Jeroboam, don't do it. Yeah. Here the guy is, he's making himself a priest. The Bible says you, you make the priesthood of the, of the highest, he takes the priesthood from the lowest mm -hmm. of the people and even makes his own self a priest. He's there, you know, uh, uh, at the altar, you know, and doing the uh, incense and all of that. And along comes the prophet. He says, prophesies against that altar. He said, the altar is going to, it's going to be sacrificing your priest and it's going to be, you know, poured out and all of that, which happened. So he was, Yahweh came down hard on this man and, uh, and so what happened? Uh, he, he established false worship. From that point on, the worship became mm -hmm. polluted. And from then on, that's why all the kings of Israel were bad, because yeah. they got off on the wrong foot. They weren't even supposed yeah. to be up there. But he wanted to separate, and he makes his, his, his own feast on a different, mm -hmm. you know, a month later, on the eighth day, and uh, eighth month, and uh, separates himself from the feast in Jerusalem and sets up, worship in these two cities. So don't go there, come here, because he's afraid, number one, uh, about you know people going back there. Number two, he's afraid he's gonna get killed. Yeah. If he goes, if they, uh, or basically if, if Rehoboam he, he, comes up there, because Rehoboam was after him anyway. Yeah. But uh, he was, uh, there was lots of reasons he did this, but they were all personal why he did this. But you know, or they were, you're right with that. And, and I think the main motivation for him was, was that he really committed treason mm -hmm. doing what he did, he, he broke, off those uh, 10 northern tribes, and that was treason mm -hmm. to, to the nation of Israel. And, and because of that, he knew that he would die if, if uh, the uh, tribes would ever go back and give their allegiance to uh, Rehoboam, Solomon's son. But, you know, isn't it typical, though, that, that people change worship for convenience? I mean, they do, you know, look at family, you know, people don't care what the Bible says. It's amazing. <laughs> it's just amazing you can explain something to somebody. And they'll say, yeah, that's right. I, I realize that. I realize, you know, for instance, Christmas is from Pagan. But you know what? My, this is what our families have done. This is what the church does. And, and it, you know, Yahweh understands. He knows. Mm -hmm. and, and just, you know, from all the examples, not just from Jeroboam, but Jeroboam is a great example. Again, Jeremiah chapter 10, which is a phenomenal passage. We recognize it's not talking about a Christmas tree. But again, Christmas tree did derive from Christmas or tree worship. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so you see such a, a strong uh, uh, parallel there within the word, but well, you know, it's just it's the same old story. What Yahweh says, do man doesn't. What he says, don't do. That's what man does. Something mm -hmm. even as simple as Yahshua's command in Matthew twenty-three, uh, verse eight, he says, "Be not called rabbi, for one is your master." So we got rabbinical Judaism calling these their priest rabbi. Mm -hmm. You have in the next verse, "Call no man father, for one is your father in heaven." So we got. 
the Roman church calling their priest father. Yeah. Exactly what he says don't do. <laughs> it, it really is amazing. It because you're really, really setting amazing. up a father in place of me yeah. is what it, both yeah. of those really mean and, uh, when you get down to it. And, and so they, they just refuse yeah. to follow the scriptures. We, uh, oh, this has been some time now, but had a guy call me at one point and he said, you know, he's been studying the Bible for 40 years. And uh, he said he, he's come up with the same conclusions as we have here at this ministry mm -hmm. after 40 years of study. And, and that included the, the paganism of, of like Christmas and Easter and, and the, the, the uh, scriptural warning of, of keeping these days. But, you know, again, I, I think Jeroboam is a wonderful example for us. You, we cannot change Yahweh's worship. We can't manipulate Yahweh's worship. Yahweh says and describes how we should worship him. And if we do it any other way, we're deviating from the word. And again, I know there's a lot of people out there, they'll say it doesn't matter. He knows, he understands, as long as we're dedicating the day to him. But none of those excuses really hold any weight. Well, they're all man's excuses, just exactly. like in the name. He knows who I mean when I call on a title. He knows uh, who I'm really worshiping. Um, you know, it, all of these excuses, mm -hmm are man-made. Yeah. Yahweh never says any of that. Yeah. He says, yeah. honor me, follow me, praise my name, glorify me in my name, on and on and on. Yeah. This is what he says, yeah. but their excuses are all man-made that aren't in Scripture. Yeah, yeah you know? absolutely. I, I completely, completely agree with that. Well, before we uh, close, because I think we're uh, probably close here in just a moment, but I wanted to talk just briefly about Israel. You know, we, we just got back from our Israel trip uh, some time ago. Phenomenal trip, and, and uh, just, uh, just a great, great trip. A lot of wonderful memories here. We had a, a great mm -hmm. uh, tour, by the way, about 14 people that came with us this time. Just curious, what was your maybe a top two or three sites? Top two, I would say, uh, well, Jerusalem. I mean, yeah, Jerusalem really there's is great. Nothing, there's nothing like it anywhere on earth. Yeah. Uh, there's so much there, so much to see, and so much history, and so much, oh my goodness, uh, you know, it is Yahweh's prized city. It's the city that he's going to come down to yeah. and establish his kingdom there. What greater thing is that on earth? I mean, that's got to be number one. And it, even the modern aspect is interesting. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It, it's fascinating, you know, and, and to see the old and new mixed together. Mm -hmm. um, te see Tel Aviv as a, a modern, high-tech city. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it just it blew my mind. Yeah. Because, and then Joppa, right? <laughs> and Joppa, right next the door. old, yeah, right next to it. I mean, yeah. this is... But I guess the, what, what really struck me the most and increased my faith the most is going to Gomorrah mm. and seeing the destruction there and seeing these ruins and getting the sulfur balls. Yeah, we have some of those here. <laughs> yes, we got them in our case yeah, over there. Absolutely. Uh, sulfur balls made of sulfur mm -hmm. and magnesium and it's nowhere else found in the natural state on earth but there. Yeah. It had to have been miraculous. Well, not only that, done. you know, when, when we were at uh, Masada, you know, we we're up top Masada, looking down, mm -hmm. you can see the Dead Sea, and you can see Gomorrah, because mm -hmm. Gomorrah sits right next to Masada, and it's white. Yes, everything else the is ash. This, everything else is this light brown, but it's white, and you can clearly see there's a distinction there in Gomorrah yeah. from everything around it. There was a whole, there was a whole valley through there. Yeah. It's not just Sodom and Gomorrah; they're like five cities. And the whole place was wiped out by Yahweh, covered. It's all burned up, and, and you see that ash. Yeah. And that ash is, it's, it's it, I don't know how deep it is, but, but every time it rains, more of these sulfur balls start rolling off the hills. You can go out and you can take them, you can burn them, you get the blue flame, it yeah. smells like sulfur. Yeah. I mean, if that doesn't confirm what Scripture says when He burns it mm -hmm. with brimstone, and that's really what sulfur was, brimstone, I mean, that, and then just see the ruins. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and to realize, uh, I was doing a little study, and it said that uh, when the sulfur burns, it gives off a, a, a noxious sulfur, sulfuric mm. uh, uh -huh. Gases fumes. Or, yeah, fumes. And that, that's very poisonous, and it would kill you pretty fast. So, yeah. and even in his mercy, Yahweh sure. probably, you know, those people died just from the breathing of the air, and then he burned it once they, mm -hmm. were, they were gone. So, uh, you know, and then he does say that there's, you know, there's more hope for Sodom and Gomorrah than for some of these, these supercilious uh, religious, you know, yeah. who, uh, who think they have it made and uh, got everything 
twist it up. So yeah. when you're ignorant, you're ignorant. And so I'm sure that, uh, you know, Yahweh will have mercy on ignorance. He says he will. So, you know, but yeah, those are the two main sites. Uh, what about you? All right. <laughs> I don't know. It's just really hard. I think we saw 31 different sites. But actually for me, Tel Dan is one of my favorite sites. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just a, it's a beautiful site. You, know, you don't see a lot of it in the, in the video where we were, but, yeah. but it's a beautiful location. It's actually sort of a nature reserve there. And uh, of course you have the old city of Dan and, and uh, Abraham's gate. And I mean, that, that's just, Abraham's gate blew me away. I mean, mm, think about that it. This, this gate goes back to the time of Abraham. That's just, and to think that Abraham could have very possibly walked through that gate at one point in his life is, uh, is, just, is just hard to believe. And, uh, you know, for me, Israel, and, and I agree with you, Jerusalem is probably number one. I mean, it's just hard to beat Jerusalem. But for me, Israel is, is, is a connection that you feel. Mm -hmm. And there's a connection there. There's something that connects you to the land like nothing, no other place on earth. And, but probably the other side, if I had to guess, uh, would be Megiddo. You know, Megiddo is just a phenomenal site. For me, it's not so much the picturesque area because it's a lot of rock and there's just not a whole lot of picturesque anything there. But, but um, it's a significance uh, prophetically, you know, because mm -hmm. we know that they're in the Jezreel Valley. They, all the armies will gather before marching onto Jerusalem. And, and the history there, you know, 26 layers of civilization there at uh, Tel Megiddo is just, again, just a remarkable sight. But um, or anyway, I'd like to uh, thank you for helping with this program and, and certainly everything we did in Israel. It was a blessing to have you there and, and to have you with uh, the uh, group and uh, do what we did in the yeah, It was wonderful. And had so many people that went with us say, I can't wait for the next trip. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're thinking about it. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, right. yeah. we'd like to um, also thank you for watching today, watching this uh, program, and it's a blessing to, to have you with us. I pray that you've learned something. You know, I pray and hope that you'll think about what we said today because, you know, worship is important. Yahweh's worship is important. We learned many, many valuable things from this man we call Jeroboam. He changed Yahweh's worship and he was condemned for it. So that's how Yahweh views worship. So again, thank you for joining us. I pray that it's been a blessing and may Yahweh bless you. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Shattering Traditions. This program is an outreach of Yahweh's Restoration Ministry. For all our materials, including free booklets and the RT Magazine, visit our website, yrm.org. Get your copy of the Restoration Study Bible, the book that's changing hearts and minds around the world. Visit store.yrm.org. Keep up to date with ministry news and events by liking us on our Facebook page. Facebook.com forward slash YRM. Subscribe to our Shattering Traditions YouTube channel and see all our latest videos. This ministry is only possible by the tithes and offerings of our members and supporters. To donate by phone, call toll-free 1-844-899-6438 or online at donate.yrm.org. Until next week, remember to search the Bible, remove religious baggage, and join our mission to shatter tradition. tradition.